everybody. Welcome all our Torah Anytime uh, viewers. Tonight we are learning Le'ilu Nishmat Chava Devora Bas Rav Shlomo HaKohen. Also Le'ilu Nishmat Noah Ben Eliyahu, Noach Ben Eliyahu, as well as Le'ilu Nishmat Avram Ben Chaim Yehuda and Yechezkel Ben Abraham. So, oh, two uh, other announcements. I almost forgot about this. First and, uh, and foremost, um, I've been going back and forth if we should make an announcement to, for people on the virtual world to join us on the Zoom class. And one of the reasons that I haven't made that public invitation is because there's a lot of, um, I don't know how you call it, crasher, Zoom people, whatever, people that join the Zoom meeting and then they just sabotage the, the shear. So I uh, was like, ah, should I say it? Should I not say it? Should I keep it? So, what we're gonna do is we're inviting everybody to join our Zoom Thursdays uh, class, uh, but only the normal people, please. So the people that are want to go and uh, disrupt, um, don't join us, basically. Uh, and how will you figure it out? I guess you could email. Um, what is the best way to figure out? I guess it's to email me. You can email me as rabbizitron at torahanytime.com. Again, that would be R-A-B-B-I-Z-I-T-R-O-N at torahanytime. Dot com. Okay, that's uh, announcement number one. Announcement number two is regarding daily giving. This is a shout out for daily giving. So uh, people here already heard me uh, speak multiple times about daily giving. If you didn't, then um, I'll listen to more of my classes. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. But uh, the important aspect, daily giving is an organization that you give a dollar a day to this organization and this organization goes and gives this money to different organizations every single day. So right now they have about a little bit over four thousand dollars coming in every single day, and I am part. I am you know part of it where I give. It goes by a month, so you give thirty one dollars a month, and that one they split up. That every single day, every single day they give a different organization a bulk money. So every single day right now, a different organization is getting four thousand dollars. I can't express how important this is, and I know I spoke about this numerous times. And the idea of when you hear something and you want to do something is very nice inside. But many people don't actually do it, don't actually go and they stop for a second and be like, you know what, let me go and sign up to Daily Giving. Uh, the, uh, if I were to tell you the, the rate of when you hear something, it's like even, even in like marketing, when you see something, you hear something, the percentage of people that actually do something with that information is very, very minuscule, very, very small. So. I strongly, strongly suggest, recommend, and uh, push, if I could say that, this, this organization, dailygiving.org, that if anybody wants an extra merit, and, and God knows we need extra merits, I, th there's, it's such an awesome organization that I wish that I would have created that organization. You know, like I'm jealous of the people that created this organization. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Donath is unbelievable, and you know, Rabbi Shlomo Wrestler. Oh, the people that started it are like unbelievable people. I strongly, strongly push this this organization. And if you didn't sign up yet, I strongly recommend you check it out and sign up at dailygiving.org. Okay. Now we get to the topic at hand. So the topic at hand is a very, very important topic for, for daily living. It's not something that you could use once in a while. It's something that you could use consistently in your life. And that is that we all try to do good things. We all try to live our lives a, in, a, in a successful way, in a way that we want to be good people. Generally, majority of people want to be good people, whether it's good person between you and God, whether it's between you and your family, you and your relatives, you and your spouse, you and your coworkers. We want to generally be good people. But what happens when we're trying to do good? No, we do good, and then we sort of get slapped in the face. So let's say somebody goes and decides that they're going to pray with a minyan. And I'm not talking about coronavirus, I'm assuming everybody is in a healthy situation. They're going to go pray with a, a minyan. And they go and they drive for the first time in a very long time. And what happens? They get a ticket. And then they get a ticket. They're like, really? So this is the reward that I get? Somebody goes and gives a lot of money to charity. And because of that, they end up losing a business deal. Or maybe they start keeping Shabbat. And because of that, their business goes down. Or maybe they start working on kosher or modesty. This is very, very important for women when they're starting to work on modesty and all of a sudden they feel they're not getting as much dates, they're not getting as much attention as that they used to. So they feel like, what's, you know, what's the point of this? I thought I should be rewarded by doing something good. So there's a very, very, very important aspect that you always need to remember to the day that you die. And that is you never, never, ever, 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 ever lose out by listening to Hashem. We have to internalize this message, and we'll give, we'll give you two sources. Source number one is in Kohelet, chapter 8, verse 5. 
It says, Shomer mitzvah lo yada davar ra. Somebody who goes and does a mitzvah, no harm, no negative outcome will come from it. That's source number one. Source number two is Midrash Rabbah. And Dvarim goes and says, Shimuli, God says, listen to me, she'en adam ali umafsid, that there is no person that listens to me and loses. Let me repeat that. I'm going to repeat this probably a lot throughout this class. Shimuli, God says, listen to me, she'en adam ali umafsid, that somebody who listens to me does not lose out. This is a promise that if you do what you're supposed to, if you listen to our Kadosh Baruch Hu, you listen to God, you will not lose out. Guarantee, take that to the bank. There's a famous story that there was, there's an organization in Israel that owns uh, wedding halls and part of their, their business, uh, I'm telling you, Jewish people are awesome, like Mika Amcha Israel. They decided that they're going to make wedding halls that are have heavily, heavily discount. They're smaller wedding halls for people that can't afford large weddings, people that go and sitting and learning to all day and they're not able to afford it. So let them go and let them have a smaller wedding and they give it to them at a discount. And in this particular wedding hall, there was two halls, two discount halls. One was larger, one was smaller. There was a woman by the name of Yehudit, and she was getting married on a particular day, and she, she booked it early to get the bigger hall. She's having a lot of relatives come from out of state, out of uh, the country. She's having a lot of friends come over. She wanted the bigger hall, so she booked the bigger hall. Then, a few weeks before the wedding, she gets a phone call from a girl by the name of Esther. And Esther is the, uh, is the other kala that's going and getting married in the same hall on the same day, but in the, smaller, in the smaller hall. And she goes and she says, listen, can you do me a favor? She says, I'm having an unexpected amount of people coming. I need the bigger hall. I know you booked it. I know it's really yours. Do you, can you do me a favor? Are you willing to switch it? And Yehudi was like, listen, you know, I booked this. I need this hall. And she's like, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, but I, I can't do it. I can't. And she said, fine. And she hangs up the phone. Now Yehudit is going and she's thinking about this and she's like, you know, I'm, start, I'm, I'm going to get married. I'm good. This is the, one of the holiest days of my life. And I would want to get as much merit as I possibly can on this holy day. So here I have an opportunity to give my wedding hall up to this other person who is in need. Maybe I should do it. And she's going back and forth until she decides, you know what? I need the merit. And by the way, this is something that I speak about when I speak to people about mixed weddings or people, you know, regarding when they're wedding, whenever they're going into, they're like, oh, you know, no, my parents, my spouse, my grandparents, my future children, they need to have this mixed wedding. Everybody has their own ideas, their own concepts, and it says, no, we need to have this type of wedding. And I, and I tell them this, this very important concept that this is the holiest day of your life and you're gonna go and you're gonna waste this and causing other people to sin, to have mixed dancing, mixed eating, who knows what's gonna happen. Like, what would you, why would you even mess that up? We know how delicate marriage is. How, how, if you look at the statistics, it's scary nowadays. How many marriage, what's the percentage of marriages that work out? So don't you want the day uh, that you're gonna get married, the day that you start this holy matrimony, don't you want it to have the most success possible, the most marriage, the most chuyot possible? So this is what Yehudi thought. Yehudi goes and calls up Esther and she says, you know what, I changed my mind, you could have the wedding, you could have the whole. And she's so, she's, she's like, I can't imagine. I thank you so much. I appreciate everything that you're doing. I know how difficult it is. May Hashem bless you, giving you, she gives you blessing, blessing, you know, and the conversation finishes over there. The day of the wedding arrives and the director of this organization gets a phone call from a man in America. And this man in America, is, he tells us this the director of this, of this wedding hall and he says, listen, I just married off my youngest child. And an appreciation in Hakarata Tov to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what I want to do is I want, I know you have two holes over there, and I know those holes are meant for people that can't afford to have a wedding. I want to pay, as Hakarata Tov, I want to pay for a, the, one of the weddings for, um, for these poor people that can't afford to make a, a large wedding. So the director says, okay, that's, that's great, that's unbelievable, it's amazing. We have uh, two weddings, uh, you know, which one do you want to, do you want to pay for? And he's like, the director says, I, I don't know, you, you tell me. And he's like, well, we have a larger one and we have a smaller one. So this, this man who called up says, you know what? The smaller one probably has less money. So let me, I'm going to go pay for the wedding of the, smaller, uh, of the smaller wedding hall. And he goes and so it is. He goes and he pays for this small, uh, for the small wedding hall. Now this girl, this Yehudit, who went and gave up her wedding hall, she gets, at the end of her wedding, she gets a check for the full 
payment of her, you know, of the entire of the entire wedding. We see over here something very important. It says Rav Eliezer Menachem Man Shach, he goes and he says, Rav Shach goes and says that one of the most important things, and it's very, very important for a relationship. Listen to what I'm about to say. Zor Rav Shach, I never ever heard of a case where a person was mevatel and he lost out. A person who gives in always wins, no matter what happens. You might see it that night, you might see it on the wedding night, you might see the, the success right then, or it might be way, way in the future. But one thing's for sure, you will always come out on top. If you give in, you will never lose out. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu was about to destroy Sodom, it says in uh, Bereshit, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, it says, Hashem Amar, Hashem goes and says, Hamechase ani ma'avram Hashem ani yoseh. Am I going to go and hide? Am I going to go and conceal what I'm about to, to, to what I'm about to do? Who's, he, who's HaKadosh Baruch Hu talking about? He's talking about Avram Avinu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu was about to go and about to destroy the Sodom. And he says, should I not tell Avram Avinu? And the question that all the, the, the commentators ask is, what's going on over here? We never see this in any other interaction with any other prophet where God's going to be like, hmm, should I tell Yonah the prophet this thing? Should I tell, you know, Isaiah the prophet this? Should I tell, you know, this prophet? No, no, no. The, the Shabbat who has one something to say, he should tell it. He just tells the prophet. So what is going back and forth over here? Answers the Chassam Sofer. Says something very, very important. He says, you want to know what the back and forth was over here? Of course, it wasn't back and forth. God knew exactly what, was, what he was going to do. But the Chassam Sofer goes and says that Avram Avinu was not on the level to receive prophecy. He wasn't on the level to receive nevoah. Why? Because in order to receive nevoah, you have to prepare yourself. You have to go and to seclude yourself. You have to go and you have to meditate on the shame. You have to meditate on God. You have to put yourself in a very, very high level. But Avraham Avinu was always interacting with the people. His, the people that are around him were people that are of the Avodah Zarah. The people are idolaters. They were serving idols. And he had to go and relate to them on, on, on their level. So he didn't have the ability, didn't have the time, didn't have the capabilities to go and put himself in that level. Not that he couldn't have, but he decided, Avraham Avinu decided to have two options. Option number one, I'm going to go and I'm going to help other people. But that's going to come on the expense of my personal spiritual growth. Or option number two is I forget about everybody else and I focus just on myself. And, I could, and Avraham Avinu decided that he's going to worry about other people and not worry about himself. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God says, how am I not going to tell Avraham what he needs to know? Yes, he's not on the level, but what is he, why is he not on the level? He's not on the level because, of me, because he's doing something for me. If he's doing something for me, he's still going to get it even if he's not on the level. Because the concept is that if you do something from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you are not going to lose out. There was a story in the... There was this... Uh, very uh, well-to-do merchant that um, he booked a, in a trade show in the Holy Las Vegas. And he rented there a large booth. He even paid for advertisement in a radio station. And he went over the top and even went and he paid for a large billboard on the highway to advertise his business. And he was going to go and this is how he's going to go and, and generate more, more income, more business. And he goes and he's about to leave and suddenly he gets in touch with his rabbi and his rabbi hears where he's going and he's like, the rabbi told him for certain reasons, some of which are very obvious, he says, don't go, don't attend this, uh, you know, this, this trade show. And he's like, rabbi, I already invested, I, I have a large booth, I have advertisements, I have radio show, I have everything set up over there. And the rabbi says, whatever you do, I'm going to tell you, please don't go. And he's going back and forth, and he decides he's going to listen to his rabbi. He's not going to go. He does not go to this trade show. Less than a week after this trade show, he gets a phone call from a woman, and she says that she works for a certain company, and she wanted to make a documentary on a small business, and she chose his business. So they flew down into his, where his business was located. They filmed the entire business for two weeks, and then they published this documentary. And this Documentary, you know, from, from this documentary, his business received this worldwide recognition. And he earned from this more money than he could have ever dreamed of making from that trade show. But at the end of it, he goes over to this woman and he says, can I ask you a question? He says, why did you choose my business? There's so many businesses out there. Why did you choose my business? So this woman, who did not look at all Jewish, goes and says, you know, I am Jewish. I don't observe everything. But my mother always told me to believe in something called Bashert. And when my boss called me up and told me when I was in, in Vegas to find a business, find a small business to do a documentary on, I, you know, as soon as I hung up, I turned on the radio 
And guess what was playing on the radio? It says, your advertisement was playing on the radio. And I was driving a little bit, and as I was driving, I saw a billboard. And the billboard was for your business. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. It's a bill. And I turned off the highway, and then I realized that I made a wrong turn. So I had to get back on the highway. And guess what I drove the second time? I saw your billboard again. I said, that's it, this is Bashar, this is from God. Non-religious, secular, well, Jewish woman goes and decides that this is from God, and she decides to call him up and, and schedule to make a documentary on his business. And from this business, he generated a tremendous amount of income. Why? Because if you do something from God, you never lose out. There was a very, very famous philanthropist, a world-renowned philanthropist by the name of Mr. Nathan Strauss. Uh, you may have heard of some of his stores. He... Um, he co-founded uh, and co-owned a store called Macy's. Uh, I'm sure, I'm assuming a few of you have, have heard of that. There's also another store that he co-founded, Abraham M. Strauss. And he was an extremely wealthy and he was very big into philanthropy. In 1892, his wife and himself privately funded the Nathan, Nathan Strauss Pasteurized Milk Labor, L Laboratory. This provided pasteurized milk for children and infants to, he was trying to fight infant mortality and tuberculosis. And it is estimated that 450,000 lives were saved because of his efforts. He also ended, he also donated a loud, large amounts of money to Al Israel. He had a, a very strong, a, sort of like a, like a Zionist towards the land of Israel. And he donated a lot of money to, uh, to Israel. And in fact, this, the city of Netanya, Whoever's familiar, Italian now was named after Mr. Nathan Strauss. It was named after him. There's also a city in, a street, I'm sorry, in Yerushalayim called Rehov Strauss. This was also named after him. He donated a lot of money to Israel. So one of his donations, he donated a building for a certain soup kitchen in, uh, in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And uh, when he came to visit, he wanted to see what, you know, what it was doing. So he went, and it was, this was the year 1912. He went over there and he saw and he watched how hundreds of people were getting foods that he sponsored, that he paid for. And he had this like great feeling of satisfaction. As Mr. Strauss was leaving this building, the building that he founded, the building that he built, he fell down the stairs and he broke his ankle and he had to be taken to the hospital. And because he was taken to the hospital, he had to delay his trip in Israel longer than he intended to. And he ended up missing a much anticipated voyage on a luxury liner that his brother Isidore had booked for him and his wife. And this luxury liner was none other than the Titanic. When he fell down those stairs, I don't know what went through his mind. And you know what, it's not written in any of the stories. But imagine he would have said, you know, but like, you know what, God, really? I just paid for all your children to be able to go and, and, and eat. And on the same stairs, that I paid for in the same building that I donated to help your children, you're gonna push me down the stairs? But little did he know that that fall, that broken ankle saved him and his wife's life. It was a very famous uh, rabbi by the name of Rabbi Salman Mutsafi of Baghdad. It was a, a Kabbalist that he, um, he was very, very careful during the days of Sfirah, between the days of Pesach and Shavuot, that he would not cut his hair, was not shaved, wanted to, would not cut anything. And during this time in his life, he was working for a wealthy uh, person by the name of Menachem Daniel. And this, his wealthy boss told him that he has a very, very important meeting and he's setting to, him up to go to this, to meet with this important uh, person. And this important person was the mayor of Baghdad. Now, the mayor of Baghdad, let's just say, was not like the mayor of you know, New York. He wasn't uh, this politically correct. Whenever you hear the mayor of any place in the Middle East, just know it's very different than where we are right now. So he was meeting with this mayor and he was obviously disheveled. He had longer hair. He, had, he, he didn't cut his hair. He didn't cut his beard. He didn't cut anything. So his boss told him, he says, you know, you got to fix this up. And he's like, I ain't touching this. I, you know, this is something that I'm very, very careful with. I don't cut my hair during Sfira. So he even went, and he wasn't sure, maybe he should, maybe he shouldn't, he went to Rabbi Huda Fataya, a big mukuba, and he says, what am I supposed to do? My boss is pressuring me, I should do this, to the point that the boss says that my whole business, my whole job stands on this, and if this messes up, then I could lose my job. Says Rabbi Huda Fataya, don't give in. This is what you stand for, this is what you keep. And even if you are at a result of losing your job, now again, I'm not telling you this the halakha, but this is what Rabbi Huda Fataya told this uh, Rabbi Salman Mustafi. And he goes on this meeting. He meets the mayor of Baghdad. 
And after the meeting goes, after the meeting concludes, the mayor goes and writes a, writes a note and he hands it over to this rabbi and he says, do me a favor, give this, to, give this to your boss. And he says, fine, he takes the letter and he brings it to the boss. And the boss opens up the letter and he immediately calls over, you know, Rav Salman, he says, you gotta see what this is written over here. And what did it write over here? The mayor of Baghdad wrote, how did you merit to have a supervisor who is so straight and diligent and truly fears God? And he goes on, and he says, in all the chambers of government, I have not found one person as honest and as industrious as, as this man. And he goes on further and he says that any other dealing, any other future dealings that I have with you, I want you only to send this person. Whatever reason that it came in his mind that God put in there, I don't know, but one thing is for sure, is that you don't lose by doing something for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In Parashat Pinchas, in Bamidbar, chapter 25, verse 7, Pinchas goes and puts, on, puts his life on the line and kills Zimri and Kuzbi. And the Torah tells us that because of that, Pinchas was granted eternal kehuna for himself and his offsprings. Now the Mithashim, the commentators, ask a question and be like, wait a minute. Pinchas was the grandson of Aaron Akon. Was he not already Akon even beforehand? What did he need to have this act and then only now he had the Kohuna? And this Fas Amas answers that what happens if you have a Kohen that murders a person? And the answer is that if a Kohen murders a person, he loses his rights to a Kohuna. So what do I have over here? That Pinchas over here, because he went and he murdered he lost, he surrendered his privileges of kuhuna. So what happened? That God said, you risk, not only you risk your life, you risk your kuhuna for the sake of the mitzvah, because the mitzvah was in a certain specific scenario, he was supposed to do what he did, and because he did that for the sake of mitzvah, not only did he gain back his kuhuna, gain his kuhuna, I'm sorry, not only that, he also, he risked his life, now he's going to live forever. As we all know, Pinchas is none other than Eliyahu Hanavi. I want to share with you a Someone who is very, very, probably one of the most famous authors in Jewish uh, literature, I guess, if it's not literature, the Sfarim. And that is the Ramchal. The, if you go to any yeshiva and you want to know what Musaf Sefer to read, what Musaf Sefer they're learning, nine out of ten times, it's Misilat Yishremu, which was written by none other than Rav Moshe Chaim Luzato. Now, Rav Moshe Chaim Luzato was born in uh, Italy in the year 1707. And he was a genius already since he was younger. When his, uh, one of his close peers, Rabbi, Chas, uh, Rabbi Kusil Gordon, I'm sorry, said of, of, of the Ramchal that by the age of 15, he already knew all the writings of the Arizals by heart, and he already wrote his first Safa on Kabbalah. That's by the age, age of 15. By the age of 15 nowadays, people barely know the Alphabet, right? Here we hear he all, not only did he memorize all the sef Safarim of the Arizal, he also already wrote his first Safa on Kabbalah. Now, at the age of 20, the Ramchal had uh, uh, a period of time where the, the Magid, the Magid is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of angel that goes and shares with the Ramchal the secrets of Kabbalah. And he started teaching this when he was teaching his, uh, his students. And this would hit a very, very rough chord because during this time period of when the Ramchal was alive, it was about 50 years after the infamous Shabzai Tzvi. And Shabbat was a big scandal where he pretended to be the Mashiach and he, with his Kabbalah, with other things, he caused a lot of people to stumble. And people were very, very skeptical. And everybody, there's another young rabbi that comes up over here, very charismatic, starting teaching Kabbalah, starting to say that he's, you know, being taught by an angel. And they started like, wait a minute, something's going up over here. They started smelling something that smelled like Shabbat Tzvi. They were very nervous. So the people, the rabbis over there, they persecuted him and they even threatening to put him into Kharem, to excommunicate him. And this is the time that he lived. One day he was walking home in his hometown in Italy and he accidentally, he was in his own thoughts and he accidentally took a wrong turn. And he ended up in this, let's call it an ill part, the, this neighborhood where people of ill repute, you know, uh, live and work. And as he's walking, he realizes where he was. He's about to turn around and leave. And he notices that there's another Jew over there. And another Jew is, supposed, is about to walk into a place of sin. And the rabbi quickly ran over to this Jew and he says, what, what are you doing? You, you can't go inside over here. God is watching you. And this person says, this rabbi, says, I've already strayed very, very far from God. So the rabbi goes, but what if someone catches you? What if someone sees you? He says, you know, they will tell the people of the community and you'll be embarrassed, your wife and your children, you'll lose your job. How will you face your, the public? Your children should do him. How will you be able to go and marry off your children? So this guy goes, rabbi, you don't understand. 
He says, I was already caught doing this. He says, the director of the school of my children told them I can't, I can't send them back to school. I had a tzedakah reception that was in my home. It was already canceled. The rabbi already told me that I should not come anymore to the synagogue. My wife is suing me for divorce and my children already disown me. He goes and he says, my life is in ruin. My life is in shambles. I'm done. I have nothing left to lose. So the Ramchal didn't give up. And he goes over to him and says, you know what? I have an idea that I can help you restore everything back. And the guy says, I'm all ears. What do you got? And he says, I want you to go back into town. Go back into the synagogue. And tell everybody that you came to this place not to do a sin, not that to do anything bad, but you came to catch me. People already don't like me. People already are, you know, are very, very upset with me. They'll be thrilled to hear about this. So this person goes and says to the rabbi, he says, you're going to do this for me? He says, you know, people are going to think of you as a sinner. He says, you know, what's going to be with you? And the rabbi goes and says, I'm willing to do this to save your life from ruin. And the guy goes and says, Rabbi, but I know you write all these farim. What is going to be with your writings? And the rabbi responded, he says, if I'm worth what I'm right and I'm real, then it doesn't matter. I have to sacrifice myself for another Jew. And if it needs to be read, if God wants people to read it, then God will make it that people will read it. So the man agreed. He turns around. They both walk back into town. The man goes back into his shul. And people started shouting at him. He says, what are you doing over here? You can't you bring all your filth over here? And he says, no, no, no. You don't understand. And he's, there's a crowd that's starting to surround him. And he says, you know why I went over there? He says, you think I did a sin? He says, I went over there because I went to catch. I knew that there was a person by the name of Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato. And I knew over here that he goes into that place and I wanted to catch him. And guess what? I went tonight and I caught him. And the Ramchal was there and the Ramchal confessed the entire thing. And he says, you're right. And all of a sudden this man who was known as a sinner, who was banished from his community, all of a sudden became a hero. The people that already had their suspicions about this rabbi, who was maybe a phony, they went and they, they, they raised this person high so high. And they, then they started figuring out, they're like, wait a minute, what are we going to do with this rabbi? This Chilul Hashem, look what he's doing, he's doing these sins in public. So the rabbis decided that Ramchal should be whipped, publicly whipped. So they brought rab this, the Ramchal to, to the center. And the Ramchal goes and says, I'm guilty and I accept whatever punishment you deem appropriate to give me. And they're about to start whipping him. And as they're about to start whipping, suddenly there's a voice from the crowd that screams out, like, no, 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 stop, stop. And they're about to stop and they see that this guy, the guy who caught him, comes out. And the Ramchal says, don't worry about it. I already confessed to my sin. And the guy says, I can't do this, Rabbi. I can't, I can't let you go through this. And he goes and he opens up his entire story. And he says, Ramchal never did anything. And he tells the whole thing and how he risked everything to save another Jew. At this point, this was the turning point in Ramchal's life. This is the point where the people saw on how far this righteous Jew is willing to go to save another Jew from sin, to save another Jew from shame. They realize that he is real. And even though it looked like he was about to lose everything at the last moment, we all know that no matter what happens, you will never, ever, ever lose out by doing something for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Avram Yisrael Ehrenberg, at the end of the Second World War, there were a few uh, you know, survivors that remained in Poland. And uh, due to the communist regime, they had a very difficult time leaving. And they wanted to go to Al-Tisrael, but it was very difficult. About four years later, in the early 1950s, there was an ability for people to go out and go out to the Holy Land, go to Al-Tisrael, go to Israel. So they went, and they, all the Jews that were, that were there, they were able to travel. They went, and they got on this boat, and they started traveling to Israel. On the way, they stopped in, in Venice. And it was, you know, Friday afternoon, and they stopped in Venice, and the boat had to dock there. The next day, they slept on the boat. The next day was Shabbat, and the, it was by the port over there, by the, by the dock. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the Italian merchants started, settle, you know, setting up their uh, merchandise. And they realize that they have people that are coming in from Poland and they're going into Israel. And they say, okay, let's take out a merchandise that is very rare in Poland and also something that will be able to sell in, uh, in Israel. And, uh, you know, within a short period of time, all the people on the boat started walking around and they started seeing, wait a minute, look at all this uh, merchandise. And they started seeing the hot commodity back then was apples. And they decided everybody there was going crazy over apples. They decided they're going to buy apples. They're going to put it on the boat. They're going to bring it to Israel. They're going to sell it for a huge profit. And this way they could be able to start their lives with a profit. There was one problem. The problem was it was the Shabbat. And this is a story that our Rami Israel Ehrenberger says about it. He was on the boat. And he says, you know, I cannot judge them. And none of us can judge them, what they went through. 
but they started doing business deals on Shabbat. And he goes and he says, you know, <laughs> my dear Jewish brothers and sisters, it's Shabbos, it's Shabbos, it's Shabbat, what are you doing? He says, but, but they couldn't hold themselves back. They, they had to do it to the point they even went over to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, maybe we'll give you some money, we'll lend you some money, maybe you also do some business. You're going to a foreign land, you need some money to start up. How are you going to get any money to start up? Here's a perfect opportunity. And the rabbi says, I'm not giving up anything for Shabbat. He says, this is the day for me and God and nothing else. Meanwhile, people were handling, they were going back and forth, they were making business deals, and people were coming back with crates and crates of, of apples. And they brought it into their rooms. Meanwhile, it's Shabbat afternoon, and the captain and the sailors are seeing all this merchandise brought up there. They're like, what, what are you guys doing? You can't bring this all up over here. You have to put it all the way down on the, you know, under the deck below. You can't keep this up here, over here. And they started complaining, no, but it needs sunlight. It needs to be refreshed. It's going to spoil. And the captain says, nothing doing. You want to take this? It's got to go down below. So they had to go and bring all the stuff down below. The plan was is that Motzei Shabbat, they were supposed to leave the, leave the port on the way to Israel. And they all fell asleep. The next morning, Rabbi Ehrenberg wakes up and he sees he's still by the port. And he's like, he starts asking what's going, what's going on. I thought we were supposed to leave. And he says, no, you know, there was a little bit of a delay. We're going to be leaving you know, shortly, but uh, we're going to still be delayed another few more hours. So meanwhile, the rabbi goes, puts on his tefillin, davins, shacharit. And after he finishes, he sees all of a sudden that the port is being set up. All of a sudden, the merchants and the, with their merchandise are coming in. And now, everybody from the boat used up all their money, bought up everything. Now the place was pretty much dead. So he's sitting over there, he's walking up and down the, you know, the road over there, and everybody's trying to sell him. And you know, he's looking over there, and he sees like, the, price, the prices of everything went down drastically because there was so much you know, pr you know, produce over there, and nobody was buying. So he ended up taking up his time. He ended up buying a few crates from this person, a few crates from this person, ended up picking the juiciest apples, and he slowly, slowly, one at a time, he put it into his cabin. Now, meanwhile, the, ca you know, the, the captain only saw one guy bring it. He says, okay, one guy, not a big deal. He was able to go and bring his apples into his cabinet and take care of it, so to speak, of the merchandise throughout the journey. They left port on Sunday. They arrived in Haifa on a Friday afternoon. When they arrived on Friday afternoon, they took out all the merchandise and everybody, when they looked at the apples, the apples were either rotten, spoiled, or it looked like it was cooked from the heat that it was in the bottom of the ship. And they, it was unusable. Meanwhile, the only person that was able to sell his apples was Rav Avram Yisrael Ehrenberg. The person that was bought apples the next day. Not only did he get a good deal on it, but he was the only one that was able to go and keep it in good condition because he kept it above the, uh, you know, above, the, above the deck. So this is all nice and dandy because all the stories that I told you until now were stories where pretty much you see the results immediately. But what happens when you don't see the results immediately? The Ran writes that Avraham Avinu would have not been punished if he had refused to sacrifice his son to Hashem. Why? Because the Pasuk says in Bereshit chapter 22 verse 2, it says, Kach na es bincha. It says, please take your son. Meaning that in na, it replies a, a, a request. And it, meaning that it wasn't a sort of a command, it was sort of a, a request. It was not actually a commandment. So, Avraham Avinu could have started thinking and thinking, like, you know what? There's so many reasons that I could think not to sacrifice my son. I mean, God himself told me in Belgium, chapter 21, verse 12, it says, Ki bi Yitzchak, ki From Yitzchak, you will have children. How am I going to go and kill Yitzchak when Yitzchak is supposed to bring me my children, my future generations? Furthermore, it's such a chilul Hashem, Avraham could have thought. If I go and I sacrifice my son, what did Avraham preach to all the people throughout the entire land? He says, God does not want you to sacrifice your children. At that point in time, people sacrifice their children to Moloch. They sacrifice their children to an idol. To think of the time that Avraham lived, that this was a normal thing to do, to sacrifice a child to, to, to an idol. And now all of a sudden, Avraham is going to sacrifice his child? He's going to be a hypocrite. And that means that everything that you worked for, everything that you did will go down the drain. There are so many reasons that Abraham Avinu could have said, you know what, this is not meant for me. Abraham, you know, may, God says, maybe do it, please, you know what, let's not do it. There were so many reasons that, God, that Abraham could have not done it. But yet, Abraham knew something very important. And that is something that we each need to really, really bring it into our systems. That we're not here to do what we feel God wants of us. But we're rather we are here to do what God truly wants of us. There's so many 
I can't even begin to like how many people I speak to. But even before that, you have reform, conservative, even certain modern orthodox. No, really, God said this is okay. This is not a problem to do this. This is not a problem to do it. And they start saying, you know, all these different aspects of what it says in Torah, and they start changing it. No, this is not what God, I know, I don't, under, I don't agree with this. Had this conversation with a person um, <laughs> last week that there was one of the fundamental, you know, principles of the Torah. That not, if you don't believe in this principle, you have no share in the world to come. And we're like, yeah, I don't really believe in that. And be like, you know, no one asked you. Like, who cares what you believe in? This is not a rating scale. This is not God didn't go over to you and be like, please, out of the 613 commandments, uh, can you rate them? You know, like this one is 10, this one is uh, zero. God gave us the commandments, meaning that we don't have to start feeling and deciding, yes, Hashem doesn't want us to do this, Hashem doesn't want us to do that. There's so many, the, the, the famous saying that the path to Gehenom is paved with good intention is so true because we convince ourselves that God doesn't want us to do this, God really wants us to do this. But if you want to be true to yourself, just like Abraham was, is don't do what you feel God wants. Do what He really wants, and that what it says in the Torah. Rashi goes and says in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 23 verse 1, when Sarah Imenu died, it says, you know why it says that Sarah Imenu died right after the Hakedat Yitzchak? Because Sarah died as a result of hearing that her son was nearly bought as a sacrifice. Says the Mikhtab Meliahu that Sarah's death was the most difficult of all Abraham's tests. Because he could have said, This is what I deserve. I had here an option to sacrifice my son, to not sacrifice my son. Man, it was a little bit of a gray area. I could have gone both ways. But he said, You know what? I'm going to give this for God. I'm going to do this because this, this is what God wants for me to do. And I do it. And not only that, what happens with Sarah? She dies from it. This is the reward that I deserve. I thought we all, we said for the, for the past half hour, we're saying that if you do something good, you don't lose out. Over here, Avraham did something very good. The hardest test that he had, he went and he passed it. And this is how he's rewarded? And the answer is, the Biyam Tehav goes and answers, that Sarah Aminu did not die because she heard about the Akedah. You know why she died? She died because a time came for her to leave this world. And it just so happened in that particular way to make it for another test for Abraham Avinu. But it wasn't that she caused her to die early. During our day and age, in the, our uh, pandemic of the coronavirus, there are unfortunately people that pass away. And uh, a lot of times people blame themselves for family members that pass away. Maybe if they would have gone and, and would have gotten, uh, you know, this vitamin. And maybe if they would have covered their mouth with, with this mask. And maybe if they would have, you know, swam in a tub of Purell every night. And maybe, 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 and maybe they would still be around over here. We have to know one thing that's very, very important. That if a person times come, a person time comes. Not saying that you should not learn from your mistakes and maybe you should do your proper precautions that you need to do, of course. But don't beat yourself up over something that was very likely the time of that person. The time for Sarah came at that time, but God made it that it would be a test, that it would come at the same time when she hears about Yitzchak's sacrifice. The Torah tells us that when it comes to observing the Torah, it tells us numerous times that we will get rewarded for it in this world and the next world, but something very, very important, it's not gonna be obvious. Because if it's going to be obvious, it's not going to be a test. If you're going to go and you're going to do a mitzvah, if you're going to give charity, and the second that you give charity, all of a sudden your stockbroker calls you up and be like, hey, by the way, you just made 50 grand. And then you're like, interesting. And then you take another dollar to charity, and then the stockbroker calls you up and be like, hey, by the way, uh, you just made another 50 grand. You'd be like, interesting. Like that's, A person's not going to have a test. A person goes and smokes on Shabbat, and because he li lights up his, his uh, cigarette, the second that he lights up a cigarette, his lighter blows up in his face and shaves off all his eyebrows. And he'd be like, aha, you know, God is angry. I mean, God works through natural means, meaning that it's not going to be obvious. Because if it's obvious, it's no test. But one thing we know, as it says in Kohelet, chapter 8, verse 5, Shomel mitzvah lo yedad avara, somebody who does a mitzvah, Never, ever loses out from it. You have, there was a Hatzalah person that um, got a call. And he was in his store. And he was the only one manning his store. And he was going, should I take the call? Should I not take the call? And he decides, you know what? i got to take the call. It was nearby. He locks up the store. And he runs out. And as he runs out, he takes care of the, you know, the call. Brings the guy to the hospital. Comes back to the store. And he later finds out that there was a very wealthy person 
that was coming into his store to do a, to do a large order. But because the store is closed, he went to his competitor and he lost it. He says, oh, what happened over here? I did a mitzvah and I lost money from it? The answer will come from the following story that Rabbi Lugasi brings down. The Rabbi David Asher brings down a story from Rabbi Lugasi that a person went to learn Torah and while he was in shul learning, his uh, business client called the house and be his wife answered and because of something that the wife told the client, the deal cost him an extra five grand that he really shouldn't have had to pay. And he goes over to his rabbi I'm hoping that he goes over straight to his rabbi and he didn't tell anything to his wife. But he goes over to his, his rabbi and he says, this is what I do by doing a mitzvah. I go to the synagogue. I sit and learn. And because of what my wife said, now I'm going to lose five grand. How is that possible? The answer is, says the rabbi, Rabbi Lugasi goes and says that this money was never meant for you. This $5,000 was never yours. This is what is called test money. This money was there to test you. It was never going to you in the first place. It appears that because you went to learn, you lost it. It appears because your wife answered and she opened her big mouth and she said things that she wasn't supposed to because she doesn't know business and she doesn't know money and whatever it is that you think happened, that's not, that's not the reason. The reason is because this was never supposed to be in you and that was all a shliach. You had a shliach from, from going to learning and you had a shliach from, the, from your wife who went and made you lose the money. The Midrash goes and says that there was once a king who had a friend. This friend was not wealthy, but he owed the king a lot of money. So the king sent his servant and he put a lot of money under the poor man's door. So now that he would have the money to pay back the king. This is what God does. So sometimes we have a debt that we have to pay. So God gives us the money first and only then does he take it away. And I'll tell you something very important, very, a very important aspect that I get this question quite often. Like, why does God tease me? Why does God go and put an opportunity right in front of my face. And this is something that we said before, but it's important to repeat it. Why does God put an opportunity in my face? Maybe, a, maybe it's, let's say, with dating. You know, I've been dating the, the cream of the crop on the opposite end of the crop, right? From the bottom, the dirt of the cream of the crop. Like, with the cream of the crop, and then when you dig six feet under, those are the people that I date, right? These are the people that I get, right? They come out of the graveside, and they come in and they bounce into the date and this is what I have to deal with. And then finally I get one person that finally is something somewhat normal. And then what happens? The, guy, the person goes and dumps me for what X, Y, and Z. But like, you know what God? Just let me stay with the scarecrows. Like, why are you going? I'll take the groundhog and now why do I have to go and hurt myself? Why do you have to go and put me in a position that will go and hurt myself? This also happens in business. Somebody's in business. Is about to close a huge deal. And all of a sudden, the guy breaks it off and loses it. Be like, why? Why do we have to do this? <laughs> like, why do we have to make this dance? Don't give me the deal. Don't let me lose it. Somebody almost goes and does a huge purchase. And the end of the day, it falls off. Be like, don't give me this. Don't give me that. Just leave me alone. Why is God going and putting us these opportunities, these situations, only to lose it, to, to take it away from us? And the answer is, is this is the greatest blessing that you could ever think of. Because what happens is that you have a certain decree. And that decree is, let's say that you should go and this person should go and lose $50,000. But God says, I don't want this person to lose $50,000. He says, what we're going to do is that we're going to work in a different way. I'm going to make him think or make her think that she almost is going to make $50,000. And then at the last minute, I'm going to take it away. And that counts as if they went and they lost the $50,000. So isn't that the greatest blessing? It's not like you made the money. You didn't even make it yet. But you almost made it and now you lost it. So it's the greatest blessing. You almost found the person, your soulmate, the person that you've been searching your whole life since 40 days when you are in your womb. That's when you are searching for that person already and then it didn't happen. So you want to know why? Because you had to go through a certain situation. Don't you rather go with this situation before you get married? You don't want to go through that situation with your husband. So God goes and gives you these opportunities and only takes it away. This is so important that we always realize that whenever things happen to us, it happens for a good reason. Especially, 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 especially if it happens after we did a good deed. There was a uh, representative of, the, of a princess in Saudi Arabia. Um, that whoever is not familiar with princesses in Saudi Arabia, whoever is not familiar with anybody in Saudi Arabia, uh, let's just say that if they come to your store, they know how to spend some money. And there was a certain Jewish person that owned the jewelry store that he did business with this princess before and uh, she wanted to buy some merchandise. Now when a princess from Saudi Arabia wants to buy merchandise, 
you make sure that you're available when because you know she's going to spend some good money and uh they the princess sent sent her assistant to look at a few pieces of jewelry and they ended up going and finding um a few pieces of jewelry estimated about three million dollars and the assistant said listen i have to report this to the princess and uh, the princess would like to meet with you, um, you know, at a certain time to discuss, you know, uh, price and uh, to close the deal. And he says, fine. He gets a phone call from the assistant and says, okay, we're going to schedule for Friday evening in a certain hotel lobby. And the guy says, the guy was a Jewish guy, he's an Orthodox guy, says, listen, it's Friday evening, this is my Sabbath, I, I can't go. And he goes over to her and says, is there maybe another day, another time maybe that we could meet? And she says, no, I'm sorry, she has no time, this is the only time that she has. And the jewelry store owner says, listen, I can't make it, but I don't want to lose this deal. I'm going to put all the merchandise with the hotel manager. And the hotel manager will show it. If you, if you see something you like, you give me a call and we'll close the deal. I said, fine. Meanwhile, it's getting close to before Shabbos. Still no phone call. Finally, Shabbos is starting and he leaves his phone on, but he, does it, he puts it on the side. A few hours go by and all of a sudden his phone rings. It's the assistant. And he's thinking over there. He's like, you know, the temptation. And he's like, no, I can't. And then a, the assistant calls a few times. And finally, the princess herself calls a few times. And he refuses, I'm not answering. He says, I'm not answering. Until finally, the phone stopped ringing. After Shabbat finishes, he calls up the hotel manager and says, you know, what's going on? What happened? And he says, you know, I showed them the merchandise. They were interested. They wanted, they called you. They wanted to close the deal. But he says, but once you didn't answer, they, uh, they decided that they're going to forget about the deal. They're not interested anymore. You're not answering, you're not on top of your game, not, and they moved, in, they moved on to uh, you know, a, different, uh, a different merchant. Now here is the kicker of the story. You want to hear the kicker of the story? Is that's the end of the story. You're probably waiting for, and then his, her father came and bought his whole store, sent it to Saudi Arabia, bought him a Bentley, and now rode him on a camel on top of the Bentley. No, the story ended right then and there. I don't know what happened. Did he make another $3 million? Probably not from that thing. Because not always do you see the results right away. He did something good. Guaranteed he didn't lose out. But, but it looked like he lost out. Yeah, it did. It did look like he lost out. I know many times in our life, we're going to do something good. And we're going to be like, really, God, this is what's happening? Where is my $3 million deal? I don't know. But one thing you could take to the bank is that no matter what you see, you should know that you don't always see the full picture. And you may, never, you may never see the full picture, only after 120. But one thing you have to know is it says in Kohelet, if you listen to God, if you follow, you're not going to go and you're not going to lose out. You look at the story of Rachel Imenu. The Gemara Shabbat, page 63a, goes and says that when someone does a mitzvah, it sort of has a shield around the person. Not only that, it also sort of prevents harsh decrees from happening to that person. Now, Achali Menu was going, was about to marry Yaakov Avinu. And we all know the story that she was going to go and she was about to marry Yaakov Avinu. And then all of a sudden, Le'ah is switched. And she made signs with Yaakov. Achali made signs with Yaakov. But in order to spear the sister's shame, Rachel decided that she's going to give Le'ah the signs. And guess what? She sacrificed everything and Le'ah got married. And you know what happened? Le'ah had children. Bila had children, Zilpa had children. Who didn't have any children? Rachel. She goes, this is the reward. Not only did I give up my husband for my sister that she shouldn't be embarrassed, but not only that, I get punished by not having any children. It says the, the Pasuk in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. It says, Vayiskov Elohim et Rachel. And God remembered Rachel. What does that mean? The Rashi says, we said this before, that God remembered that Rachel gave her sister, his sister, the code. And because of that, something very interesting happened. Rachel was never destined to have any children. She was supposed to be barren. But because she went and she gave up the code for her sister, guess what? She ended up having two of the tribes, Yosef and Binyamin. So many times in our life, we do something good and it seems like we lost. And we're like, God, where is it? Where is my reward? Where is it raining from heaven? How come right now my spouse is not knocking on my door saying, here? I'm your zivug, I'm your bashert. Here's flowers, here's a, a ring with 12 carats. You know, please come live in the mansion. You never have to work a day in your life. Why? What's that not, not happening? I'm trying so hard. Because what God does is God, after you do something really good, after you do a mitzvah, what God does is takes that merit. And sometimes God sort of redirects it. 
recalculates that merit and puts it into something more important in our life. Who knows how many things were supposed to happen in our lives negatively. And you know what? Because we did a good deal, we averted that decree. We got rid of that bad decree. We don't know what it was. There was once a Baal Shuvah that went, came with tears in his eyes to his rabbi. And he says, Rabbi, I don't know what God's doing to me. He says, I left my world. I left the secular world. I was working, I had everything. I left and I came and said, learn in yeshiva. And I learned and I learned and I learned. I became a full Baal Shuvah. I come and I'm 100% religious. And I started to date. And I started and, you know, couldn't find anything. Finally, I found one girl. One girl that would feel perfect for me. And at the end, I was about to get engaged and all of a sudden the father broke it off. I said, you want to know why he broke it off? He broke it off because I didn't have a job. He says, Rabbi, I left my job so I could serve God. I left my job so I could sit and learn to ah. And this is my reward? I lose my soulmate? So God go, uh, uh, the rabbi goes over to him and says, listen. He says, I don't know soulmate, not soulmate. I'm, I'm telling you one thing. That you didn't lose out. And by the way, this story also ends right here. I'm not going to say that uh, and a week later, a woman came and he lived happily ever after. And he realized that the other woman was not even close to as good as this woman. No, you know, it doesn't always happen. And you know what? Sometimes people get married and people, realize, and people go and be like, you know what? The other person would have been better. Why did I lose that? And I can't tell you the answers, but one thing I could tell you, and it's very important to realize that not all stories have a happy ending. Not all stories have a happy ending, let me rephrase that, in this world. If you do something good, you may not see it. You may look like it, but you're guaranteed going to gain from that. And God constantly puts tests in front of us, opportunities of which we can go and gain. Sometimes we see the benefits. Sometimes we see the result right away. And when we see the result right away, when we do a good deed and we see the, the benefit right away, we have to utilize that chizuk. We have to utilize that power for the times that we do something good and we don't see the power. We don't see the goodness of it. Pilkei Dabileza goes and says, Tov achad betzar. There's one act performed with difficulty. It's better. Yotel mimea shelo betzar. It's greater than a hundred that without, without difficulty. Meaning that if somebody, let's say, has a certain job and this job pays a thousand dollars, certain, you know, whatever, you know, let's say he has to do a, a specific job and that was going to give him a net income of a thousand dollars. But if it would be more difficult, now that job is worth a hundred times more, meaning that now that job is a hundred thousand dollars. When you do a mitzvah, you get the thousand dollar reward. But if you do it with difficulty, that thousand turns into a hundred thousand dollars. There was a certain person that saved enough money to buy a certain item. And this item cost a thousand dollars and they were waiting to buy the purchase this item. And as they saved the money, finally the day came where they're going to be able to go and purchase this item. They go and they walk onto the store. And as they're walking to the store, all of a sudden they get a tap on the shoulder. And they turn around and see there's a long lost friend from years ago. And the friend starts opening up and he starts telling him, you know, you don't know the difficulties that I'm going through. And he, and he really feels bad. He's a really close friend of his. And he's going through a difficult time. And he says, listen, I feel bad, you know, telling you, that, you know, asking you this. And we just met after so, such a long time being apart. But is there any way that I could borrow some money? He says, I'm late at my rent. My landlord's going to kick me out. I need $1,000. Otherwise, me and my family are on the street. And you feel so bad, but you're like, you just saved this $1,000 for this. Can you go and, and you decide, you know what? You're going to take this $1,000 and you're going to give it to your, you're going to lend it to your friend. And you give the money to your friend and you go home. And the next day you're starting to move around the money and to other money and said, you know what? I still want to get this. It, I just lend him the money. I'll still get it back. He took money from different areas. You take the $1,000 and you walk back to the store. You get to the store and you say, okay, I'm here to purchase this item. And the guy in the store says, oh, I'm sorry, we're sold out. He says, we just sold the last one. And be like, do you have any other locations that have anything? And they look at the computer and be like, no, we're sorry, we're sold out everywhere. And he says, not only that, because of coronavirus, this is going to be a long time until, you know, we're, we're going to get this back. This, you could forget about this for the next few months. And this guy's like thinking about, really, God? Like, I just gave the money for it yesterday. If I would have got it yesterday, I would have got my product. So the first thing that we have to learn is never ever regret if you do something good. This guy has to make sure that he does not regret giving that money because you know what? If you regret doing something good, part of that reward gets lost. Secondly, you have an opportunity right now because right now you're in pain. You're in a difficult situation. Your next mitzvah could be worth so much more. Your next mitzvah could be worth a hundred times more than what you have right now. The next person that comes and be like, hey, can I borrow 10 bucks? Be like, no, no. 
No, no, no. I just lent a thousand dollars and now I lost my iPad, I lost my whatever iPhone, I'm not gonna do it. No, you have that opportunity to just like go crazy. Or you have to, and you're like, you know what? Let me lend the money. And you don't know that that $10 may be worth spiritual reward a lot more than the $1,000 that you gave previously. We never understand the concept of the reward and punishment and how much it's actually worth. A person goes to sleep one night, has the best, you know, like an amazing sleep, wakes up like, wow, I just slept in clouds. Like, it was unbelievable. Wakes up early, the guy goes to daven, and he has the greatest davening, like he's concentrating on every word. He hears everything, he is in the zone. After davening, he goes and he sits and learning with Yeshua, with the rabbi, he not only understands everything the rabbi says, he is like two steps ahead of him, asks the rabbi a question the rabbi can't even answer, and he's like on top of his game. Then he goes into work, and he's in work, and he's making business deals, he's making money. Finally he gets home, his kids are sitting there nicely, they're doing their homework, the house is spotless, the wife is all in smiles. How was your day, Adi? And he was like, oh, it was great, how was your day? It was, oh, it was great. He eats a little bit of dinner, goes back to the synagogue, prays, learns a little bit more, and goes to sleep. And he comes home, goes to sleep. Thinks as he's about to fall asleep, he's like, wow, what a successful day, what a great day. He's sleeping for about 54 seconds when suddenly his baby is crying. And then his wife starts crying. And then those other kids are like, this, he's been up for so many hours, can you take him? Can you take the baby? And he's taking the baby and the baby is throwing up and the baby's not feeling well. And he, you know, he tries to put the baby to sleep, 20 minutes later he's up and he's falling and he's falling and he's having a crazy night. He finally gets to go to sleep at about 6.57 a.m. Seven o'clock, his alarm you know, wakes up. He takes the alarm clock and he throws it across the room. And then it snoozes and snoozes and it keeps on, and then it's like breaking and it's making these noises and finally he's like, fine, I'm up. He strolls into the synagogue. He barely is able to pray. He is so tired, he's falling asleep. He's try then he stays for the class afterwards with the rabbi and he's like, he can't understand the thing the rabbi is saying. Sounds like he's speaking Japanese. He has no clue what's going on. He goes into the office, he's losing money. He comes, finally he comes home. He has one kid that's pr you know, practicing his monkey bars on the chandelier. The baby is sitting over there with a dirty diaper and the other baby is investigating what's inside said dirty diaper in texture and then using it as lotion, whatever it is, there's a situation going on in his house. And he is pulling out his hair. And finally, you know, he's trying to help his wife. He's put the kids to sleep. He's exhausted. He goes over to pray in the synagogue. And he prays Alvit. And then finally he decides he's going to try to learn a little bit. But he falls asleep while he's learning. He wakes up for the last 10 minutes. Tries really hard to concentrate. Gets absolutely nothing. Sounds like foreign. And he goes, goes home and he lays down in bed. And he's like, God, why? He says, two days ago. Perfect day. It was an awesome day. This day, I couldn't pray. I couldn't learn. I couldn't do business. I couldn't do it. I spend time with my kids. Like, what are you doing to me, God? And God says, he says, which day do you think is worth more? He says, you think the day that everything went well for you, that day you think you got great reward. You prayed so well. You learned so well. You were so successful at home. You were so successful at business. You think that that day was successful? He says, that wasn't a successful day. The day that everything went wrong and you still went to the synagogue. The day that everything went wrong and you tried to go and learn, but you fell asleep. So that is worth a hundred times more than the previous day. We come to opportunities in our lives where we go and we are in a place where we feel that we just did something really good. And when we did something really good, God is all of a sudden, you know, feels like we're punishing us. And God says, no, 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 I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you an opportunity over here that you can go and achieve a hundred times greater reward. I want to finish off with one story. This is a famous story. If you hadn't heard it, I would strongly recommend you to listen to this story by the person who said it himself. And this person, his name is Alex Clear. Alex Clear is from London, and he grew up secular, not religious, and he grew up listening to uh, music. He was very into music. He listened to jazz, soul, hip hop, and when, since he was younger, he started playing instruments. He played the trumpet, the drums, the guitar, he sang. And he decided that he's going to make music his career. And he started off by playing in the bars, playing in any open mics that he had. And, you know, some time went by and suddenly he meets uh, two producers. And they offer him a contract. The problem was the contract was terrible. But it was his first contract. 
he was a newbie, and he decided, you know, he's got to get, take what he has. And he takes the contract. A year goes by, and he meets a publisher. And this publisher offers him another deal. And this deal was so much better than the previous deal. And he decided he's going to take this deal. Some time goes by, and he's still playing. He's playing wherever he can. And all of a sudden, something really, really big happens. Island Records, one of the largest record uh, companies in the world, comes over to him, and they're interested in him. And they, they decide that they want to sign him on. And he's like, this is great. You know, it doesn't get bigger than Island Records. So he goes and he signs with them. And he's recording his debut album. And the way that it works is once you record your album, you have to now promote the album. And during this time when he's recording the album, this is when Alex started thinking about religion. And he started taking, you know, Hebrew courses. He learned a little bit about the Hebrew language, learned about the alphabet. He started meeting with a few rabbis, started learning about the few stories in the Tanakh. And the more that he studied, the more that he learned, the more that he wanted to implement in his life. He started observing the Shabbat. He started doing kosher. He started doing Jewish prayer. And this is the time that he signed on to Island Records. So he was keeping kosher, he was keeping Shabbat. He was living now in a Jewish neighborhood. He wasn't living anymore in that part of town where all the musicians lived. He now moved to a more Jewish religious place. And uh, Island Records goes over and they wanted to sign him up. And he says, um, okay, but I have a few criteria. You know, I'm kosher, I don't play on the Sabbath or holidays, and so on and so forth. So it's a record company. And the record companies are used to, let's just call them weirdos. You know, the musicians have like weird, you know, obsessions, weird things. The artists, you know, get into the zone. How, what they would go and how they would go and produce their music. They have to go and play with the cows for like a month and then they have to go and swim with the dolphins and then whatever it is your process fine your process is Shabbat your process is kosher no problem they were used to it he records his album and now it's time to promote it but the problem is every TV appearance that he had to appear on was on Friday night every show that he had to do was on Friday night so he kept on saying no 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 I'm sorry I can't go I can't go I can't go I can't go and uh, they said okay fine we understand you know, you can't be able to go. Finally, the studio calls him up and be like, you're not going to believe it. We got you the golden ticket. He says, you are go going on tour with a very famous musician from, I guess, England, uh, with, by the person by the name of Adele. And you're going to go on tour with, with, uh, with this person. And guess what? It's not, on a, it's not on a Saturday. It's not on a Sabbath. He says, great, when is this? And they go, they tell him it's on April. And April is when Pesach is. And he goes over to Alex, goes over to him and says, you know that thing I told you about uh, the Sabbath? And they're like, yeah. He says, well, during April, there's like a week straight of like only Sabbath. Like I can't do it. And they're like, are you telling us that you're canceling your tour with this famous person? And they're like, he's like, I, I can't do it. So fine, they, they, they couldn't do anything. He didn't go on tour. His album was released and guess what happened? Nothing happened because he didn't promote it. He didn't go on tour. He didn't, wasn't able to do anything with it. That Yom Kippur, six months go by Yom Kippur, Alex is reading the story of Rabbi Amnon. Rabbi Amnon was the author of Unasana Tokef. And the story of, of Rabbi Amnon was that he received this ultimatum from, uh, you know, to, to convert to Christianity or die. And Rabbi Amnon was and says, give me three days to think about it. He says, when I think about it three, three days, I'll give you the answer. And as he goes home, all of a sudden he instantly, he's like, why did I ask for three days? He says, there's no way that I am going to go and give up and convert to Christianity. He goes and he runs back and he says, you could kill me now because I'm never going to go and convert to Christianity. And the bishop was so furious at Rabbi Anon that what he did was he tortured him. He removed he, his arms and leg. He amputated him and then he sent him home and he died. Alex heard the story of Yom Kippur, and he took the story to heart. He says, a Jew does not compromise on his principles. After Yom Kippur, his cell phone rings, and they say that there's a huge gig going on. It's in four days' time. It's a huge gig. It's not on Sabbath. Don't worry, it's a huge gig. And Alex looks at the calendar, and he realizes it's Sukkot. And he goes over to them and says, remember about that thing that we had in April, that week-long thing? And they're like, yeah, this is not April. And he's like, yeah, well, I got another week-long thing in this month also. And they, the studio is like, listen, Alex. He says, we're not going to play these games anymore. He says, this is the ultimatum that they gave him. He says, either you're going to do this gig 
or we're going we're gonna to drop you. So he says, you know, I, I can't make it. And he was dropped. He was dropped by the studio. His biggest opportunity in his life, he got with the, the, this, this craziest, this is universal, this is the highest level the, of the music industry. He got to it, and now he lost it all. And he was very down. He went over to his rabbi, and he says, you know, like, rabbi, what's going on? And the rabbi tells him, says, you know, rabbi, you know he, says, he, he tells him the story of Abraham. He says, Abraham invested his entire life for God. He invested his entire life to go and tell people, do not sacrifice children to, to, to your gods, to idolatries. And you know what God told him? Now you sacrifice. And you know what Abraham was really willing to do? Abraham was willing to give up everything that he worked for in his entire life for God. But what happened at the end? Abraham didn't give up anything at the end. And not only that, half the planet today believes in monotheism thanks to Abraham. So Alex thanked the rabbi for the chizuk, but the chizuk didn't pay the bills. He was broke, he couldn't pay rent, he couldn't pay his musicians, he owed them money, and a few months go by, and still nothing. All of a sudden he gets a phone call, and it was a, a company that was doing an advertisement, setting up the advertisement for a company called Microsoft. And they wanted to use his song called Too Close for a new version of Internet Explorer. So they asked him for permission, and he's like, okay. He figured, you know, like a, you know, some sort of, they'll use a small piece of the music for the, you know, for the advertisement. It's going to be like background music. Meanwhile, they went on this massive complaint campaign. The ad was everywhere, worldwide. It played 24-7 everywhere. And not only that, they didn't put the music in the background. They played it at full volume. They heard the voice, and, and people started listening to this, to this song, and people started liking the song. And this song suddenly blew up throughout the entire world. This song was the number one in Germany. And if I'm not mistaken, he was sitting and learning in Yeshiva in Israel, where he gets a phone call and says, you know, your song is playing number one in Germany. Can you come down? And he didn't even have enough money to pay for a ticket to go down to Germany. And they went, you know, whatever it is, he orchestrated that he was able to go down to Germany, do it like a, some sort of, a, you know, talk show, whatever it is, and then he went back to Yeshiva. But he was number one in Germany, and then it also hit number, the top ten in multiple countries. United Kingdom in England, it hit number four. In the United States, it played at number seven. This music went throughout the entire world. Whether it's on YouTube, it, in going platinum in the music industry means that you sell one million copies or more. By the end of the Microsoft campaign, Alex's album sold more than six million copies. And he had more than 67 million views on YouTube. So it looked like he lost everything. And months went by. It wasn't like the second that he says, well, you know what? No, I can't play on your theme because it's, because it's too cold. He hangs up. All of a sudden, he gets another phone call from the other phone, the red phone. And all of a sudden, this phone goes and says, oh, guess what? We want you to go. No, no, no. Months went by when nothing happened. And he didn't give it up. He was still religious. He still learned. He still did what he needed to do. And at the end, we see that no matter what, you never, ever, ever lose out by listening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Not in this world and not in the next world. It might appear that way. It might take some time to see it, but one thing is for sure, and as a promise, you could take it to the bank. You will never, ever, ever lose out by listening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The was once a person that stepped accidentally on the Vilna Gon's talus. It was a little boy. And the Vilna Gon goes and says to him, my child, you should live until 100 years old, but please get off my talit. And the man lived a very, very long and healthy life. And he never got sick until he was in his 90s. When he turned 100, he wrote his will, knowing that the time has come. And then he died. Now, this is a very famous story that you had a bracha, you get a bracha from a Vilna Gon, you know you take that to the bank. But here we have a word of God. If the Vilna Gon's word is powerful, imagine the word of God. And God says that if you listen to me, if you listen to what I say, you will never lose out. As we said in Kohala, chapter 8, verse 5, Shomel mitzvah lo yadadavara. A person who performs a mitzvah will no harm will ever resolve from it. And the Medlul Shabbat, we said also, Shimuli, God says, listen to me. She'en adam shomeh afsid, because somebody who listens to me does not lose out. And this is a lesson that we have to take. And we have to in really internalize this, that no matter what happens in our lives, when we do something good, we never, ever, ever lose out. And with that, we'll open up to questions. 
Can okay. I ask a question, Abby? Yes, sure. First of all, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank um, you. So what if something amazing happened to, I'll, I'll just give a personal example. Like I felt my life was saved at one point. Okay. So is there a way to quote unquote, see what I did, um, that, like, what did I do to deserve it? Almost like, is there a way to, is there like a chart that says like, oh, you did this. And like, that's why your life was saved. So it's difficult. It's a good question. So the question is, is that if let's say you had a miraculous event happen to you, can you pinpoint what you did in your life to deserve that miraculous event? And the answer is right. it's very difficult, very difficult because we don't know where it came from. You could try to think of it. It's probably healthy to think about it be like, you know, maybe because because then you're starting to connect points. You could think about it, you know, like maybe because I gave this person, you know, charity and maybe because I did this good deed, that's why I was saved. It's good to think about it, but ultimately we never know. When we come to 100, after 120 to the next world, it could be a, a reason that like, I don't know, it could be just like for something that you didn't even think about, you smiled at somebody. Like, and that person was like contemplating suicide and because of that, you saved their life and that's the reason. So while we could and we should try to pinpoint where we got the merit from, we never actually really know where it came from. Got it. Thank you. Um, one other question. I have a whole list, but I won't ask them all. Uh, okay. Are there times when we're not supposed to do a mitzvah, like when we're supposed to say no? Is there a time when we're not supposed to do a mitzvah? Um, yes. Well, a mitzvah hababa averaf. Let's say you have a, a mitzvah that's going to be that's only going to be through doing a sin. So then you shouldn't do it. But if you come to that that case, I don't even want to give an example. If you come to a certain situation where by doing a mitzvah, you know what, I will give you an example. Let's say um, a person wants to go to a wedding and they know that this wedding is not going to be modest, and not a modest wedding. This, uh, and this person, is, let's say, is, is a guy, he's going to have a hard time guarding his eyes. So the question is, should he go to a wedding, do a mitzvah of misameh hatan vekala, but at the expense of now, he is going to a place of Tumah, a place that is going to be, uh, you know, impure sites. And the answer is no, you should not go to the wedding. So again, but in those situations, it's very important to speak to a uh, Orthodox rabbi and ask, what should I do in this particular situation? Great. Thank you so much. Sure, of course. Okay, we have some questions over here that was sent in, so let's read it. In regards to modesty and doing things for Hashem, different rabbis say different things about what's considered halacha or allowed versus not allowed. One example is how much of the foot between the knee and the ankle needs to be covered, or if we can wear heels or not. Is it best to strive for the most machmer? Is this what Hashem wants from us? Thank you. Okay, so that's a very good question. Let's, let's make this question a little bit more broader, where you have certain rabbis that are lenient on certain things, and certain rabbis are more strict on certain things. So what should you do? Should you go to the strictest way possible, or maybe you should go to the more lenient way possible? What does God actually want from us? So, first thing is very important is, when you have your rabbi, stick to your rabbi. So if your rabbi says, you know, to do this, you stick with, with your rabbi. Don't start going shopping around. Well, this rabbi says this, so let me take the leniency from this and the leniency from this. Whatever your rabbi says, stick with what your rabbi says. Yes, even though your rabbi gives a leniency, it is better if you could be stricter and you could go to the more of the machmer way. But the question is, if you are able to, if you are able to, then you will be blessed. You know, the there will be a great blessing that comes upon you. But if you're not, then it's difficult and you're going to feel like it's going to make you fall X, Y, and Z. Those are situations that you should speak to a rabbi or someone knows you well and knows the halakha well also and say, okay, what should I do in this situation? I'm having a very difficult time at X, Y, and Z. Should I go and do this? But at the same point in time, it might affect this. And the rabbi will tell you, okay, maybe take upon, you know, leniency in this area and stringency in that area. So this, in this, in this particular question, it's very important to ask specifically a rabbi that knows you and a rabbi that knows also the halakha and how to go and, and correctly juggle that situation. Here's a good question. When Orthodox rabbis disagree and speak against each other, then how does one know which rabbi Hashem wants him or her to listen to? That's a good question. I, I, to be honest, I don't want to answer that question because... I don't believe the correct way generally is to speak against rabbis publicly. So I, I don't, uh, this is uh, something that should, uh, again, there are certain times when it's called for, but like I said, you have a certain rabbi. And if this is a rabbi that's well respected in the community and not, you know, there are certain rabbis that unfortunately they call themselves rabbis, but they, 
you know, they, they, their views are not really orthodox. And you have other rabbis that go out against them, so you have to realize, you have to, if you're not sure, then speak to your personal rabbi and say, hey, listen, what, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Because there are certain, there are certain times where rabbis are not really rabbis, or, or rather rabbis should not be rabbis, if I, if I could say that. But generally, this is, a, this is not a common uh, situation. This is more of a, a rare situation. So generally, if someone's an Orthodox rabbi, we could assume, uh, you know, assuming that he is an Orthodox rabbi, is a competent Orthodox rabbi. Okay, next question. In regards to the story of a woman who ruined the deal for her husband, I once lost money for someone else when selling products because of a mistake I made. Obviously, it was meant to be, but I got a lot of the blame and the insults because of it. How should I look at that situation that I was supposed to go through a specific test that it caused me and can it and be the messenger for the other to lose money? So this is an important aspect of how to look at it. Yes, you are. So if somebody goes and was the cause of someone else to lose money, yes, you are the messenger to lose the money. But then there's other numerous questions they have to figure out. Was it because of your negligence? Was it because that you should have done something else? Do you have to pay the other person back? Do you have to go and fix it? So there's a lot of different aspects of going into it. When you, this is a general idea that if you hurt somebody else, don't tell the other person, hey, just the messenger, sorry, you know, speak to God. Yes, you know, I did steal six billion dollars from you, but you can't blame me. I'm the messenger, speak to God. No, obviously, if you do something wrong, you have to go and fix it. And you have to go, if you have the ability to do it, if it was your fault, if it was beyond your control, then fine. But uh, the way that you're supposed to look at it, that if you did something and hurt somebody else, Yes, you are the messenger, but you have to also go and fix it because God has many messengers. He didn't need to choose you. And if God chose you, you have to figure out what is it that I need to do to make the situation correct. Okay, next question is, um, I know some people will love to, leave the, uh, to, love to, have, to hear this. Shiu, will this go out on YouTube? Yes, it will be. And what will be the title? That's a good question. The title will probably be, You Never Lose Out by Listening to God. Probably that's what, uh, probably that's what it will uh, be. So, uh, yeah, God willing. Okay. Looks like that was the final question. All right. Thank you all for joining. Chazako Baruch. And may you have an amazing and successful, let's just go with life. I was about to say Shabbat, but why not life? <laughs>